Thank you. That concludes the debate on UK Shared Prosperity Fund, what this means for Scotland. It is now time to move on to the next item of business. And the next scheduled item of business is a statement by Kate Forbes on national strategy for economic transformation. And given the Cabinet Secretary answered a government-initiated question on this matter yesterday and that relevant material is already in the public domain, we will move straight to questions from members. I intend to allow around 30 minutes for questions, after which we will move on to the next item of business. And I would be grateful if members who wish to ask a question could please press their request to speak buttons now. And I call Liz Smith. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I am grateful for your decision to move straight to questions, uh, given the fact that the statement about the economic strategy uh, was made yesterday. Not market-tested or pragmatic, that was the assessment of the economic strategy from Sir Tom Hunter. And we know that the STUC effectively disowned the strategy, despite having been key to the consultations. Others, like the CBI and the Chambers of Commerce, were a little bit more encouraging about the lofty ambitions, but they said that there was a real lack of clarity over the detail, so hardly a ringing endorsement of the Cabinet Secretary's new economic strategy. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary three questions? Firstly, she says in her Scotsman column this morning that Scotland must become more welcoming for innovators and entrepreneurs. I completely agree with that. But can I ask how that fits with the SNP's priority for a second independence referendum, which virtually all leading businessmen and women tell us would create a whole lot of renewed uncertainty and additional cost at the very time when the exact opposite is required in order to attract new investment that we so desperately need? Secondly, Chris van der Kool of 4G Studios says that none of the Cabinet Secretary's ambitions will be achieved unless there are serious efforts to improve education and skills across Scotland. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary if she agrees that publication of the recent OECD report into school education is essential if we are to fully understand and address the weaknesses in our education system? And thirdly, can I ask again about when the Scottish Government will provide the full details about the current situation at the Scottish National Investment Bank given its key role in supporting future investment. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and can I just thank you for the opportunity to answer questions this evening as well. In terms of uh, Liz Smith's uh, questions, and of course she was invited, as all opposition spokespeople were invited, to uh, the, the virtual launch yesterday. And of course, opposition parties uh, regularly point out what the challenges are facing the Scottish economy, and we've had exchanges on a number of um, occasions uh, in this chamber pointing out the challenges. We haven't shied away from those challenges in this strategy. We have addressed them head on. And my invitation to Liz Smith and to others is what would you remove from the strategy that you don't think will deliver and what would you add in if you think that we're missing uh, policies? In terms of the specific answer, uh, questions that Liz Smith asks, first, um, on, on Tom Hunter's point, Tom Hunter was invited to comment on the draft on a, a number of occasions. He asked for us to focus on business. That's what we've done in this strategy, to focus on ensuring that there is a growth strategy. Secondly, she quotes uh, Chris van der Kyle in terms of investment in education, and she will see that one of the five pillars is very much on skills, a point that she has made a number of times and I hope one that she welcomes. She asks what will be different about this strategy. This strategy will focus on unlocking our potential and unlocking new markets, particularly as part of the transition to net zero. So there's a lot of substance in the strategy, but as with any strategy, what will ultimately be measured is the outcomes. Some of those outcomes are short term in terms of how we recover over the next few months. Many of them will only be delivered over the longer term. And my invitation to all people in this chamber and beyond is work with us to deliver this, because I don't think there's anything in this strategy that Liz Smith ultimately disagrees with. Daniel Johnson. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and, and thank you for arranging this opportunity to ask questions in Parliament about this strategy. Indeed, perhaps, perhaps the best way of summing up is better late than never. And just to the Cabinet Secretary's comments just there about the so-called invitation to the launch, let's be clear, that invitation came at four o'clock on Monday and was at a time when we were all in Finance Committee. It's just not a credible invitation at all. 
But more, and more importantly, she asked what would we remove. I, I, I genuinely wouldn't remove anything. But I think there are things missing. I think, first of all, it is a report that is largely broad uh, in terms of its objectives. I think there is uh, insufficient analysis of the deep structural problems. And there's no real analysis about what would change in terms of delivery, which if a strategy is to be worth its name, needs to have those things. In terms of the specific questions, there is a key focus on entrepreneurialism. But given that 99% um, uh, of firms in Scotland have seen zero productivity growth over the last decade or more, do we not need more focus on scaling up, and, or rather skilling up, existing firms rather than focusing on starting new firms, although that is important? In terms of reskilling, and I, I welcome those comments, but again, what is going to change? Labour market participation is a key problem in the Scottish economy. So how will this be delivered through existing structures and mechanisms or new ones? And how will flexibility be incorporated? In terms of the cluttered landscape, we seem to be adding uh, new bodies, I think two new uh, bodies. And indeed, that means I think we've gone from three to seven boards and bodies if you, if you start from the beginning of the last uh, parliament. And that is a key issue identified by, amongst other people, Audit Scotland. How will that be resolved? But finally, can I ask this question? In future, Cabinet Secretary, when major plans and strategies are launched, can you please bring them to Parliament first and so that we can ask questions here first rather than private invitees to a private event elsewhere? Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. In, in terms of uh, Daniel Johnson's three points, if I could start with entrepreneurialism, and he talks about the importance of scaling up versus uh, new uh, uh, startups. And that's precisely backed up by the analytical paper, which, if he hasn't read, I would strongly um, uh, recommend he reads. Obviously, the, the, the draft, the strategy that's been published is the tip of the iceberg. But underpinning that is a very comprehensive uh, structural analysis of the Scottish economy. And it provides answers, I think, on a number of exchanges that we've had in the past. And obviously, one of the points very much is on the scale up. So at the moment, if you look at the uh, longevity or the lifetime of most uh, new businesses uh, in Scotland, uh, most businesses that last beyond five years, there's about a 42% uh, survival rate beyond five years. So he's right. The point about scaling up uh, is really important. And that can deliver significant benefits from the Scottish economy because those scale ups, those growth businesses are the ones that are creating jobs and contributing significantly to GVA. In terms of skills, he talks about flexibility. And actually, if there was one word to describe our proposals around skills, it is flexibility. So ensuring that people have access to the right skilling opportunities whatever they are. So there's, there's proposals in here in terms of uh, the provision of uh, qualifications uh, throughout somebody's life, being able to access, uh, access that through a digital academy. Uh, there's a comment here around how we work with business to provide an upskilling and a retraining offer that's easier for uh, businesses to access on behalf of their uh, employees. So flexibility is probably the watchword of our skills uh, proposals. In terms of the last point on a cluttered landscape, Actually, I would disagree with that because one of the key points in the strategy is not to add new layers, but either to repurpose what's already there or to remove. And removing things never goes down well. It's quite a difficult thing to do politically. But in terms of a cluttered landscape, it does not create new bodies. It either repurposes them. For example, the Enterprise and Skills Strategic Board is going to become the NSET Delivery Board so that it can monitor delivery with me co-chairing and an individual from the private sector. So I would just uh, caution against the suggestion that it clutters, it actually declutters and refocuses uh, on the vision that the NSEP provides. Willie Rennie. I'm afraid there's not much new in this. After 15 years in charge, this government is looking very, very tired. The report doesn't properly reflect the government's failed industrial intervention policies at places like Loch Haber, and at BIFAB, thousands of jobs were promised that have just not materialised. The report doesn't cover that. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, how is Scotland going to exploit the jobs potential of offshore wind if we can't even find enough workers to build the eight jackets for the NNG wind farm in the fourth? How on earth is that going to happen? Um, in terms of Willie Rennie's first point about how much is new in here, again, I would offer the invitation to him that if he thinks we are missing something major in the strategy, tell me. If you think we should remove something from the strategy, tell me. 
But otherwise, that is just rhetoric. And in terms of uh, the, the position on Le Haber, I know for a fact, as a constituency MSP, that we saved jobs that wouldn't have been saved had we not intervened. But he asks a really important question, and I would refer him perhaps to um, the second programme of action in terms of new markets, because he's right that with Scotwind comes the opportunity of up to uh, £1 billion being invested in every gigawatt of energy that is produced. And the strategy here very specifically and methodically looks at how we reap the benefits of that beyond what has been done uh, to date. How do we develop the supply chain? And there's, there's three areas I'd point him to. First of all, it's the private sector funding. We have a world-renowned financial services sector. We need to align that with the funding that's required. So the private sector funding that's required. Secondly, and to do that, uh, the First Minister is chairing a, an investor uh, panel. The second point is around supply chain, developing the supply chain. The commitment is there from these developers that have won the bids to develop the supply chain. We need to make sure we support uh, businesses uh, to be there. And my last point uh, here is around ultimately delivering on um, all that's required in terms of the investment and the supply chain and making it joined up. Uh, and again, in the strategy, you'll see a very joined up approach so that we ultimately reap the benefits of a significant investment in the world's largest commercial offshore floating wind farms. Thank you. Many members, of course, wish to ask questions, and I'd be grateful for short and succinct questions and answers. And I call Michelle Thompson to be followed by Murdo Fraser. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary provide any further information about the underpinning methodology and analysis undertaken to inform the strategy and ultimately led to the key themes identified to deliver improvements? Cabinet Secretary. The talks about the evidence, and we started with uh, an evidence paper, an analytical uh, paper, 133 pages, which has been published and is available for anybody to read. And the five new policy programmes of action have been carefully chosen based on that evidence, not based on rhetoric or ideology or political desire, but based on the evidence of where the big challenges are, long-term structural challenges or short-term, and where the greatest opportunities are to position Scotland to maximise the greatest uh, uh, opportunities of the next uh, 10 years. So there's a robust evidence base underpinning each of the programmes, and it's available for anybody to look at. Murdo Fraser, to be followed by John Mason. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary announced a new talent attraction programme to bring people of working age from other parts of the United Kingdom to uh, come and live in Scotland. It's an important initiative because the working age population here hasn't been growing as fast as many other parts of the United Kingdom. But why does the Cabinet Secretary think that for the past 15 years, people from the rest of the UK haven't been coming to Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Well, on the contrary, the evidence wouldn't back that up, which is why I would refer the member to the analytics uh, paper. But in terms of uh, what we're seeing right now, of course, is uh, the challenges facing uh, people from out with the UK to relocate to Scotland for uh, visa requirements. And what we've set out in this uh, strategy is, one, to really target uh, the skills that we need. So if you take, for example, uh, the tech industry, which was forecast to be the second, growest, second fastest growing sector in Scotland over the next five years, um, they regularly say that they struggle to recruit particular skills. Um, and we want to target those skills uh, from the rest of uh, the UK. So people are moving to Scotland, attracted by the work-life balance and um, uh, attracted by the, on average, lower living costs in Scotland. But we need to do more to make sure that we're aligning the skills need with those that are moving here. John Mason, to be followed by Paul Sweeney. Thank you very much. The transition to net zero is clearly a huge imperative. So I welcome Section 3 headed New Market Opportunities. Can the Cabinet Secretary say any more about how we can benefit from these new markets and new industries? Cabinet Secretary. Well, it is one of the biggest economic opportunities facing Scotland, and that's why the second programme focuses on strengthening Scotland's position in new markets and industries. We're already well regarded as a pioneer in the net zero space, and a number of independent um, uh, analysts have suggested that Scotland has the greatest potential to create uh, green jobs. But success is not inevitable. It needs to be uh, in delivered. And that's why the plan sets out with how, alongside the just transition, we'll also secure the private investment required through this investor panel, as well as developing the supply chain. Paul Sweeney, to be followed by Gordon MacDonald. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. The strategy describes Scotland's desire to be a magnet for global private capital and foreign direct investment. On the face of it, something that sounds impressive, but we know that there actually needs to be more critical analysis of this. There are two types of foreign direct investment, developmental and dependent. And so often in Scotland's economy, we have seen companies that flourish under Scottish ownership and then can only achieve growth by foreign takeover, often meaning that capabilities are stripped out of the Scottish economy. The report and the, uh, the strategy doesn't offer any critical analysis of how we do this. There are examples around the world of how we can tackle this. For example, the Scottish Investment Bank could be taking anti-takeover shares in strategic firms to protect them from predatory takeovers. And that's actually happening in the UK already with Oxford Nanopore, for example. Could the Cabinet Secretary take consideration of this as being a way to improve the strategy? Well, I think um, the member raises a, a good point. And obviously, Scotland has been the top destination in the UK for FDI outside London for the past six years. Edinburgh, Glasgow, Aberdeen have appeared in the top 10 UK cities uh, in 2020. So we are good at securing FDI. But the point he makes is very important, which is I don't want to be celebrating the creation of jobs elsewhere outside Scotland. I want to be celebrating the creation of jobs here in Scotland. And if you take the supply chain as an example where we want Scottish businesses to be qualifying for work here in Scotland as part of the development of Scotwind, we need to work very constructively and very intentionally with those businesses with the greatest potential to participate in that supply chain and ensure that we do retain and create the jobs here. Gordon MacDonald to be followed by Maggie Chapman. In order to deliver economic growth in Scotland, it is vital that we encourage new start-ups and support existing businesses. Can the Cabinet Secretary provide any further information about how this economic strategy will support existing businesses to grow? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the strategy is certainly not just about new industries and uh, markets. It is about backing our existing industries, supporting them to improve, to grow, to be more productive, to be more creative, to transition to net zero and to, to reap the benefits. So the five policy programmes in the strategy is intentional about supporting new and existing businesses to prosper. And for example, whilst the SME sector is the backbone of the Scottish economy, we are also conscious that a number of large businesses, particularly, for example, in energy, um, it, are creating a number of jobs and have great potential um, to drive productivity. So we'll work with both SMEs and large businesses, basically any business that wants to be more cr uh, productive, wants to be more internationally competitive and wants to scale and grow. Maggie Chapman to be followed by Ruth McGuire. Thank you. Whilst we are pleased to have secured commitments to fair pay in public contracts, support for cooperatives, social enterprises and public ownership models and a focus on green jobs, the Cabinet Secretary will know that the Scottish Greens believe that prioritising growth as a measure of economic success drives in increasing inequalities, more precarious work and unsustainable resource extraction and exploitation. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary how she will ensure equalities and human rights are embedded in all economic development activities and over what timescale, and how she will engage with communities so that Scotland's economy works for them and supports well-being and a vibrant economy? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the member hits the nail on the head in terms of suggesting that growth or economic performance should be for a purpose. And the strategy is very clear that the purpose that we want to see is raising living standards across Scotland, ensuring that no region, community, household or individual is left behind when it comes to both participating and, and, and um, enjoying the benefits of success. And uh, at the launch yesterday, certainly, there was a, at least one representative of Unite who, who was heartened and uh, a quote to hear multiple mentions of trade unions, uh, that two of the foundation stones re refer to better paid work and based on, were based on fair work principles. And that's what we want to embed, both directly in terms of conditionality with uh, government support, but also ensuring that there are workers' voices throughout um, the sectors that we want to see grow and develop. Ruth McGuire to be followed by Douglas Lumsden. Presiding officer, the strategy includes a welcome focus on improving wages and conditions in sectors where low pay and precarious work are most pre prevalent through the sectoral fair work agreements. Can the Cabinet Secretary provide further details as to how the Scottish Government will work with trade unions and industry to deliver high fair work standards? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as the, I said, the, the strategy ultimately wants to raise standards. It wants to deliver good jobs. It wants to address structural inequalities. For example, the underrepresentation of, of women in parts of our economy and to ultimately reduce uh, poverty. This strategy needs to play a part in reducing child poverty. 
and we will require payment of the real living wage and a channel for effective workers' voices in all government support by this summer. So we're not waiting 10 years. We're uh, moving quickly on this and we'll work with employers and trade unions in sectors particularly where low pay and precarious work is prevalent, including leisure, hospitality and early learning and childcare. Douglas Lumsden to be followed by Jim Fairley. Thank you, President Officer. This strategy gives absolutely no support to the oil and gas industry, even though tens of thousands of jobs right across Scotland depend on that industry. And while we still have a demand for oil and gas, it's better for our economy and better for the environment that we produce it ourselves. The last thing we want is to be reliant on Putin or his likes for energy supply. When will this government stop turning its back on the oil and gas industry? and the northeast of Scotland and encourage investment into this sector because at present this government is driving investment away. Cabinet Secretary. Well, considering there were representatives from the energy sector from the northeast on the advisory council and considering that Aberdeen and Grampian Chamber of Commerce have welcomed the strategy yesterday, eh, the member might want to reflect on whether it's strictly accurate that there is no reference to oil and gas or to energy, because actually, in terms of one of the programmes of activity around new markets, this is very much about helping and working with the energy, tra energy sector uh, to transition. And I think I've referenced uh, the energy sector in, in most of my answers uh, this afternoon. Such is its importance, not just in terms of ensuring that households across Scotland have access to secure uh, um, energy sources, and it would help if uh, perhaps uh, the UK government could regulate energy as well to ensure that people where that energy is being produced are not paying more than elsewhere in the UK. Jim Fairley to be followed by Claire Baker. Thanks very much, President Officer. I very much welcome this ambitious strategy and especially the focus on entrepreneurship. However, it is vital that the benefits of the strategy are felt right across Scotland, including in our rural communities. So can the Cabinet Secretary provide any further information as to how its strategy will ensure a transformation right across Scotland? Well, Cabinet uh, Secretary. Sorry. Sorry. As the member will know, um, as a representative of rural Scotland, that is first and foremost in my mind when it comes to a strategy like this. I, perhaps the area that I'm most enthused by in this strategy is the notion that if every community and region of Scotland is able to perform well and is given the right support, then our national economy will, will, will prosper. And if we leave any part of our economy behind, then we will un ultimately undermine that national performance. So we have spoken to businesses, workers, stakeholders from across uh, Scotland, uh, and I want to ensure that we work with rural representatives to embed this strategy. And that's partly why I'm going to the Western Isles tomorrow to discuss this further. Claire Baker to be followed by Christine Graham. Um, thank you, President Officer. Um, during the pandemic, there was much talk of building back better. The STUC have described this report as a missed opportunity and a strategy for economic status quo rather than economic transformation. The detailed actual pl action plans will be crucial if this analysis is to be changed. So can I ask why the action plans weren't included with the strategy and how the action plan progress will be measured? Cabinet Secretary. I didn't quite hear the last um, comment, but in terms of uh, STUC's input, can I just put on record how much I've appreciated their, their input, uh, particularly um, Ross Foyer's um, very helpful steer and fully recognising uh, the fact that um, it, all stakeholders want us to go as far as possible. Uh, right at the heart of this strategy, perhaps running through every single programme of action, is a commitment to fair work. And there are two of the five programmes which are specifically about well-being and raising standards of living, embedding workers' voices and ensuring fair pay it runs throughout our uh, economy. So it is embedded in terms of the action plan. The action plan will be published to ensure that we have a means of delivery that is effective uh, and we will be ensuring that there are metrics alongside that. And again, I would perhaps refer her to the analytics paper, which outlines what some of these metrics might be. Can I just give Ms Baker the opportunity to repeat the end of her question? Um, thank you, President Officer. It was just to ask about how progress would be measured on action plans, but I think the Cabinet Secretary has perhaps covered that. So thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Christine Graham to be followed by Jamie Halker Johnston. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. The strategy focuses, it says, on five key priorities, and I quote, within Scotland's current powers. Well, in the previous debate, we found out how they're already being undermined by the Tories. 
So with energy, migration tax, including corporation tax, VAT, national insurance, all reserved, does the Cabinet Secretary not agree with me we could do so much better for the prosperity of Scotland and the just distribution of its wealth with independence? Cabinet Secretary. Well, Christine, Christine Graham is right that when it comes to uh, economic prosperity, a number of the key levers that you would normally expect to see being deployed in an economic strategy are reserved. Migration uh, uh, powers, uh, employment law, energy powers, taxation, regulation, these are all reserved. So what we've committed to in this strategy is to push the current levers as far and as hard as we possibly can, because we are serious and we are ambitious about delivering a strategy that ultimately improves Scotland's economic performance. Jamie Halker Johnston to be followed by Martin Whitfield. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Having waited so long to see it, it's an underwhelming report. In response to its publication, Professor Ronald MacDonald said, and I quote, the kind of substantive issues we need to discuss are simply not there, and that on solutions, it is simply a rehash of all the failed scripts we have seen since 2007. So won't the Cabinet Secretary accept that after 15 years of SNP economic mismanagement, this delayed report, this underwhelming report of rehashed ideas, fails to address the long-term issues in Scotland's economy and is simply not good enough? Cabinet Secretary. I would accept is that I haven't heard a single policy proposal from the Conservatives this afternoon or indeed in any of the debates that we have had. The member talks about the need for new and bold ideas. Well, let's hear them, because I've been waiting a long time to hear anything from the Conservatives. The strategy that we have set out today, backed up by 133 pages of structural analysis on the substantive issues, outlines the areas where we think we can make the greatest difference. And if the member thinks that we should take anything out or add anything back in, I am all ears. <laughs> Martin Whitfield to be called by Stuart McMillan. Sorry, before I go ahead, um, can I just say that I don't expect to hear members shouting across the chamber at one another, and I would like to make sure that we can hear questions and responses. And I call Martin Whitfield to be followed by Stuart McMillan. I'm grateful, Presiding Officer. Back in 2014, Scotland was the most highly educated country in Europe, among the most well educated in the world in terms of tertiary education. Yesterday, in a speech, the Cabinet Secretary pointed out that we are now only just one of the highest. The report states that it recognises significant inequalities persist in educational attainment. 10% of Scotland's workforce have low or no qualifications. The answer in the statement talks of implementing a lifetime upskilling and retraining programme for both individuals and businesses. So after 15 years in power, and success of upskilling maybe not seen for up to 10 years. Is that it? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the member is right to say that we have one of the most educated populations anywhere in Europe. And I think that's something to be welcomed and to be celebrated, because it demonstrates that we have a strong foundation to build on. The key right now, which it, we all are well versed in if, if we speak to any organisation trying to recruit, is to ensure that our businesses, our organisations, have the skills they need right now, but the skills they're going to need in 10 years' time. And the pace of change when it comes to technology, when it comes to the uh, transition to net zero, is going to require us to up our game and ensure that we have a flexible skill system to respond to the need, not just the need today, but the needs over the next 10 years. Stuart McMillan to be followed by Liam Kerr. Thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, also, the Scottish Chambers of Commerce yesterday said, and I quote, Scotland's businesses will applaud the scale and ambition set out in the strategy, which has the potential to live up to its name and truly revolutionise the Scottish economic landscape over the next decade. So can the Cabinet Secretary provide any further information about the engagement work which has been undertaken with stakeholders to ensure that the strategy delivers for all of Scotland's economy, in particular dealing with the regional imbalances that Scotland has? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the engagement to date has been extensive, it has been in depth. Um, I can't count the number of uh, meetings um, or submissions that I have been party to. Economic trans transformation has to be a national endeavour. In other words, whilst we can set the vision, which we've done in this document, 
whilst we can renew our focus on delivery, which we have done in this document and will do going forward, ultimately all of us have a stake in Scotland's success. Every member in this room has a stake in Scotland's success and ensuring they contribute, but also they represent uh, the businesses who want to contribute. And I look forward to working collaboratively with trade unions, with the private sector, with the third sector, in order to deliver what will be an immensely successful strategy. And Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary missed an important question from Liz Smith earlier, so I'm sure she'll welcome this opportunity. Given its key role in supporting future investments, when will the Scottish Government provide full details about the current situation at the Scottish National Investment Bank? Yeah. Secretary. Uh, any questions uh, about the, the matter that the, that the member is referring to are for the former Chief Executive and uh, the Board. I said yesterday I recognise the appetite uh, for answers, uh, but on this uh, it is important that the Board uh, is given its place uh, and those questions are for the Board. Thank you. That concludes questions on the national point of order. Daniel Johnson. I am very grateful, Presiding Officer, uh, for allowing me to make this point of order. I, I know that there are a number of members still actually waiting to answer, ask questions. And great, given the great discourtesy, I believe, that the Government have shown to the Chamber by not coming before now, I just wonder if I could propose a motion without notice to extend uh, this session uh, under Rule 8.14, Section 3, uh, so that we can hear the questions for those that wish to ask them. Um, there are other matters to attend to in this afternoon's business. This was agreed by the Bureau. Um, I have already taken extra questions, so we will move on at this point. Um, but, of course, it is a matter for the Bureau whether we come back to this subject in a lot further time in due course. Um, that concludes questions on the National Strategy for Economic Transformation. And we'll move on to the next item of business, which is consideration of business motion 3422, in the name of George Adam, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a business programme. And I call on George Adam to move the motion. Thank you, President Officer, and moved. Thank you. No member is asked to speak on the motion. The question, therefore, is that motion 3422 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 3426 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau on stage one timetable for a bill. And any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press their request to speak button now. And I call on George Adam to move the motion. Thank you again, President Officer, and moved. Thank you, Minister. No member has asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 3426 be agreed. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed. The next item of business is consideration of three Parliamentary Bureau motions, and I ask George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau to move motions 3423 and 3424 on approval of SSI, and 3425 on designation of lead committee. All of which I am glad to move, presiding officer. Thank you, Minister. The question on these motions will be put at decision time, and there are six questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first is that motion 3389, in the name of Claire Adamson, on behalf of the Constitution, Europe, External Affairs and Culture Committee on UK Internal Market Inquiry, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. The next question is that motion 3394, in the name of Tom Arthur, on Scottish Government Debate, Local Government Finance, Scotland Order 2022 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed, therefore we will move to a vote and there will be a short suspension to allow members to access the digital voting system.